Happy Meshuggah Mondays, everybody. Welcome back to yet another trek through Meshuggah Tensei Jabba's Reincarnation novel series. We're on volume 18, chapter 10. And I totally thought that I was going to burn the rest of this volume with this Meshuggah Monday. May still happen, but I don't think it's going to happen anymore. <laughs> the moment I got to chapter pretty much 11, I was like, holy crap, um, never mind. And then as I kind of peaked the next chapter, the 12th chapter, I'm like, yeah, it's probably going to take some time. We'll see. We'll see. As usual, uh, if I do get to that vol that chapter, I'll just read it live. But with all that said, yes, thank you, everybody, that dropped by for the premiere. Hey, chat, hope you guys are doing well. Hope you have a great rest of your Monday after Mashuka Monday, or unless you have to leave early, I'll forgive you. I typically do. Sometimes I get a little upset, but <laughs> yes, greatly appreciate everybody that supports the channel monetarily through Patreon, tips, links, super thanks, memberships. All that stuff, it's what makes this happen. You, I cannot express that enough. Without you guys, this doesn't happen. And even if you're not able to, you know, help with monetarily, you know, leaving a like, all that kind of stuff, it helps so much. Sharing it out to your friends. Yes, and additionally, David, thank you so much for the super last week. Uh, Alvaro, uh, Noah, and Sergio for the membership. Thank you guys so much for your support. It's 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 fantastic. But yes, uh, the only thing that I have left over from last Mashuka Monday is as we were doing the Mashuka Monday, I it just dawned on me like... Oh, that's right. <laughs> Lada died in the future Rudius situation. And so I'm like, did the, the, the did that diary have anything in it about sort of the world decaying or anything like that? Of course, all they really said is that if Lada dies or the Savior dies, it could be that the Savior's not chosen until like some certain point in their pregnancy. It's obvious during the pregnancy there are the Savior because you already had the Sacred Beast going to Roxy even before she was showing a bump. So it's obviously that some point after conception, it seems like they are chosen to be the, the, the savior. But additionally, they also said that when the savior dies, the tree withers, and when the tree withers, the sacred beast withers or dies at some point. So I was kind of curious if there was any indication in the diary that either the sacred tree died or the sacred beast died or anybody said anything about that. Or, again, my theory on the idea that if the tree is sort of like a lot of other stories, when the tree dies, nature dies... Was there any sign that the world itself was decaying? But didn't seem like that was anywhere mentioned in the in the diary, which, to be fair, makes sense because, you know, I, I doubt that he even cared. Uh, the future Rudius didn't care. Roxy died, and he was just focused on this one thing. So a lot of the things that was happening around the world, he probably didn't care about. He didn't really mention much about the politics or anything that was happening at the time because he was only concerned about this one thing. Yes, for a brief moment, he was concerned about Sylphie and the things around, you know, Osra and stuff like that. But outside of that, doesn't care. So it makes sense that there was nothing mentioned, but it, it was still like one of those, like, realization moments of, oh, yeah, if that's the case, future Rudius and his timeline, that savior died. And that could have had, yes, again, the Sacred Beast probably died at that point. So cool, interesting little thought process that popped in my head. But with all that said, let's move on with it. Chapter 10, The Other Slave, Part 1. Again, I, 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 got, I got super emotional reading some of this stuff. This first part, I kind of hated, and I wished I condensed it more, but I've been super busy this last, last week, so I apologize. But anyways, several days passed since the jerky murder. Persena returned to Shariah with them, and Edis was more than happy to dote on her. <laughs> she also joined the ranks of the mercenary band. Today, Reese was working with Zenoba as usual, trying to improve his magic armor. They were making some minor adjustments to version 2 while developing a more powerful version 3 and version 4. Rhys had a mountain of ideas, but a majority of them were impossible or next to impossible to produce. Development was a slow progress, but he enjoyed working with someone and making baby steps towards a goal. Today was no different. Zenoba and him studying blueprints spread out in front of him. This is another one of those kind of minor touches at that idea that Rudius himself is enjoying a normal life. <laughs> Again, always, every single time something like this comes up, I immediately think of old Rudius. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious if anybody else has that happen to them. As they're reading this series, you constantly think, what would the old Rudius think? And it's obvious that that's what this, the Refugian's going for here. He's always going for this idea of, now he likes this. He probably never liked this before, but now he likes this. It's just like the whole thing with the, you know, having a party and drinking or whatever. It's like, normally I would yell at people that would be loud and boisterous and drinking and being merry. Part of it probably because of jealousy thing, but he just didn't like it. He hated it. And now he's enjoying it and realizing, oh, so this is why they did it. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> this is the same thing. Always having something like he goes to Zenoba and has fun, even though he hates the process seemingly. He likes that he's able to do something with Zenoba, building towards something. It's, it's a massive feeling of achievement. However, 
Suddenly, Zenoba blurted out, It seems that Julie is hiding something from me. Really? Julie, of all people? Yes. She's doing something in secret behind my back. Huh. It was rare for him to worry about something other than dolls and figures. No, it's not. <laughs> I, I think I say this every single time. Every time Rudius thinks, oh my gosh, he actually thinks of something besides his dolls. Like, you, you, if you have to keep thinking that, Rudius, it's obvious that this is nothing new. <laughs> but it was especially strange for Julie to be weighing on his mind. I don't necessarily agree with that. Yes, I, I think it's more of an aspect that we don't get every perspective that Rudeus has with Zenoba, and he could probably see a lot more of those moments where Zenoba just doesn't seem like he cares. But again, the whole situation with her period, he was freaking out. Obviously, he's concerned for her. Perhaps she had grown on him since they lived together for so long. So, what do you mean by in secret? Lately, she has been going to the market by herself. Even if I ask her what she bought, she won't answer me. In fact... She won't even show me the figurine she's supposed to be working on. It's like she's making something else without my knowledge. I have tried to ask her what she's doing, but all she does is brush me off. Well, she is getting to that age. Maybe this is just a phase. Julie had Julie had her first period not so long ago. Julie had Julie. We're already. <laughs> it's already in what WTF? <laughs> WTF seven C's moment. Oh my gosh. Julie had Julie had. <laughs> it's like they're head hatting. <laughs> She had her first period not long ago, and physical changes often brought about mental changes. In short, Julie was entering puberty. She knew Zenoba since she was very young, but he was still a man. It wasn't strange to be embarrassed about him discovering her secrets. Like, for example, the color of her underwear. That kind of stuff. No, Rudius, you're only concerned about that. <laughs> well, she probably would. I don't know, there is that aspect of, like, since she was raised for so long, being under his essential command. It is one of those things of where you, you think that somebody like that probably grows up thinking different. And I, and I think there is an element of a lot of people sort of being raised in different environments. They, they, their think process changes based on that environment. Now, granted, these days, thankfully for a lot of countries, we're raised sort of the same. We have these moralities and whatnot, and thus way our, our way of thinking is pretty much the same in a lot of regards. But in a situation where somebody's forced to have to be under somebody, and yes, not technically have much freedom, at least in even in her mind, yeah, you would assume that she probably would not really think of that the same way. But who knows? I don't know. I I have no. I, there's thankfully I have no firsthand experience. What do you suppose I should do? I don't see any option but to leave her to her own devices. Everyone went through puberty at some point. The person gradually transforming from a child to an adult. This causes people around them to have to change how they treat the person as well, more as an adult, or risk driving them to rebel. Zenoba needed time to figure out how to interact with her. There was no fixed script on how to deal with people. It was something you had to learn over time. And I think Zenoba's kind of learned a lot of that stuff. It, I mean, just my my thought process and how he sort of changed how he deals with situations. Like, easy example being, if you took the Zenoba from when Rudius first met him, and all he really cared about was his figurines, and anybody that got in the way of his figurines pretty much died, <laughs> now you have a situation where you have Julie there and he's panicking over the fact that she's bleeding it's like it's a massive change i think if if you had julie sitting next to him back when he was in sharon and she's bleeding he'd be like somebody take care of this girl or whatever he probably wouldn't even he probably wouldn't even say anything hmm. since she's a slave forcing her to answer would be an option i'm sure but you plan to make her tell you no no she may leave with me now but she actually belongs to you, Master. I don't have the authority to do that. Though, I would not oppose your decision if you requested it of me. That That's a weird thing. Uh, <laughs> let me read the next part. There was a hesitation in manner, even if he did say that. Calling her Rudeus a slave was just an excuse. Even if she belonged to Zenoba, he had no intentions of forcing her to obey him. Rudeus was no different, so he couldn't blame him for that. I like how it kind of corrects it here. I, I, I thought there was going to be an inconsistency in this writing, around this part right here, but it seems to kind of correct path here. Again, way back there when they first purchased Julie, it was Zenoba that forked the money, bought her, and I think even contractually, it was to him, not to Rudius. And I think what it's kind of implying here, and I, and I could be wrong there, I, I think I, I don't think that they contracted it to Rudius, but I know that Zenoba paid, and I think they contracted Zenoba. But anyways, either way, I think that the pro thought process here is as it stands now, I think because Zenoba feels himself under Rudius, Rudius is my master, and it was Rudius's idea to get Julie. It's a twofold thing. One, it was his idea, but additionally, because he's my master, she belongs to him. 
And that's, I think, what his mindset is there. So even in the situation, he's thinking, Zenoba's thinking, it's yours, master. What do you want to do? I'll never oppose what you want to do with her. And I don't think it's necessarily an excuse. He's, Rudius is thinking that it's an excuse calling it Rudius a slave, but that's not the excuse. That's not what he's doing there. It's more of an aspect that it is your decision. It is yours because you are my master, no matter how you point at it. It's not, it, the, saying that it's an excuse is it's sort of saying that Zenoba is, is, pushing the responsibility onto him so that he doesn't have to make the decision. Oh, well, it's easy for me to say it's your decision, which I don't think that's really the case. As long as it's nothing bad and it isn't causing problems, I don't see any harm in just leaving her be, do you? Zenoba scrunched his face. I actually do consider it a substantial problem that she won't share the figurine she finished. <laughs> that's the problem. I guess I can see where you're coming from. Hmm, in that case, why not just ask Ginger to try talking to her? Reese assumed that it might be something that she's uncomfortable with sharing with the opposite sex. So Ginger seemed like a good option. Hmm. Oh, that's a splitted idea. Surely, Ginger will be able to handle the matter smoothly. <laughs> Let her handle it. She's good at that girl. It was hard to believe that Julie was already entering puberty. Time sure went quickly. It probably wouldn't be long before Lucy hit that same age in her life. She'd been growing more used to me lately. She be, she be, she been growing... There's where that had came... <laughs> They took the head from here and they put it over there. That's what happened. She, she been growing. She been growing. <laughs> she been growing. She been growing more used. She been growing. Seven C's, you got to get your heads in the correct order. It could be a logical sentence. I just never seen anything like that besides slang. She'd been growing more used to him lately, and a fond father-daughter relationship was beginning to bloom between them. Alas, he was sure the day would come when she'd be back to being fussy, <laughs> yelling at him not to wash her underwear or not wanting to take a bath after him. It made his stomach knot. <laughs> he even promised that he wouldn't <laughs> force her to bath with him. By the way, Master, there's another topic I'd like to broach with you. Oh? Do you have any interest in boxes? Boxes? Reese thought that he meant a sweat box or a club. I've never heard the term sweat box for a club. It makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense, but I don't think I've ever heard that term. But this was Zenoba. It was probably about a treasure box or something. There was a lot of them out there, encrusted with gems and the like. Reese had seen a few of them at Pedagus's place, and they were the very definition of luxury. Though, they were empty. <laughs> I had to I had to note that he literally says they were empty. Like Rudius like, Rudius is totally like self-reporting himself, like, uh yeah. Those were some really nice ones at Pedagus' Fortress. For some reason, they were all empty, though. Not that I looked at them or anything. <laughs> he did let them just kind of wander the place. There's all these There's all these rooms, too. And they're all empty. Like, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> just walking around, opening chests and opening doors. What kind of boxes? Ones with the most incredible designs. I have seen ones of this caliber before. Actually, oh no. It would be better for you to see them with your own eyes rather than have me explain. Despite Zenoba's love for figurines, it seemed that he had a discerning eye for the other crafts as well. For someone as picky as him to shower anything in praise made Rudius curious. Again, <laughs> Rudius is like always having to focus on how single-minded Zenoba is when he's not actually. In that case, I guess I'll check it out. Zenoba grinned from ear to ear. I knew you would say that, master. The shop in question was tucked deep within the artisan quarter. There was a few people milling around, mostly fussy artisans, with frowns on their faces. Zenoba walked with purpose, knowing exactly where to turn. The store was the size of a small civilian house that had no sign to indicate it was a shop. Inside, there was barely any light, and what little light came from outside was blocked by the undecorated displays forming haphazard lines. Still, it was light enough to see the merchandise. Top shelves had female dolls in fancy outfits, tucked inside lavishly decorated wooden boxes. The dolls and the boxes were extremely elaborate. The boxes must have been what Zenoba was talking about. What do you think, master? Now I see what you're talking about. Those are really nice boxes. I knew you would agree. Honestly, the boxes were more finely constructed than the dolls. The craftsmen matched the lumber of the boxes to each doll's design before carefully chiseling them down and decorating them with jewels and cloth. Only problem is that the dolls look more inorganic compared to the organic vibe of the boxes. Reese figured that his figurines would look better nestled inside of them. It all made Reese feel the craftsmen took more care on the boxes than the dolls. It, as much as I really think this is like a bunch of fluff right here, it is technically what I was asking for before when they just jumped to selling the figurines and the books. Like, oh crap, he could have told us how that whole process happened. But at the same time, I am, it is kind of curious to the idea of somebody having so much fixation on the housing of the dolls and it seemingly being more focused on that. And you think it's because they're just better at making boxes, 
But no, it's more the fact that they, it seems like they make the dolls and then get fixated on what they, they sit in. And it's almost as if they love what they create so much, even if it has imperfections, that they put more effort into what follows it up, which is sort of technically an interesting concept. It, again, it gets in that idea of somebody that just thinks different. That's why I'm so fascinated with Zenoba. He thinks different. It's just so foreign, yet so purposeful, I guess. Reese then knows the name on each box. Layla, Abby, Sophia, Clara, Francine, Natalie. Zenoba, what are these names? Those are the dolls' names. Duh. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, Radius. Thanks for asking the obvious. Reese never named his figurines before because they were based on actual people. But people did name their dolls in his previous life. It allowed them to remain attached to them for far longer. Although the dolls were less stunning than the boxes, surely it wasn't because the artisan loved the boxes more. There, that's where he kind of picks up on it. After all, would a parent love his child less just because they were ugly? To be clear, Rudius found his own daughters as beautiful and lovable as the finest gems. <laughs> Correction, <laughs> Rudius then follows Zenoba further into the shop. They came to an area with a workbench covered in tools and a man sitting at it. Zenoba realized that they were unnoticed, so he rang a nearby bell, alerting the man to his feet. He was as tall as Zenoba, sharp gaze, hollowed cheeks, frazzled hair, and calloused hands. After the man noticed Zenoba's face, familiar face, his lips curved and his voice shot up. I didn't even think of a voice for this dude. Well, <laughs> well. What a jump to a weird voice there, Andrew. Well, well. Look we have, look we have here. <laughs> Damn it, seven C's. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna assume that's some weird speech pattern, okay? Well, 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 look what we have, look we have here. If it isn't Master Zenova. Yes, I'm back again, Master Belfried. You are always more than welcome. What brings you here today? If I can remember that voice. They were so friendly with each other. Reese wondered if they were brothers from a previous life. I came back to introduce you to my master. I spoke to you about him before, if you'll remember. Oh, him. The man responsible for those beautiful daughters, yes? Precisely. This is the owner of the workshop, Master Belfried. He is a talented artisan, responsible for a number of excellent boxes, or rather, doll beds, you saw decorating the shop. And Master Belfried, this is my master, the great and powerful magician, Rudius Greyrat. He is himself an eminent craftsman whose figurines no other person alive could possibly mimic the kind of rare talent that will likely be spoken of for many decades after his death. His words overflowed with such reverence that it felt like overkill and made Rudius pretty uncomfortable. Honestly, Rudius didn't care about how people spoke about him when he was dead. They would probably just badmouth him that he was a lady killer who kept numerous wives. I have heard many rumors about you. You are not merely a top tier magician, but you're also a deeply learned craftsman as well. I assure you, compared to Zenoba, I'm pretty ignorant about the stuff. Oh, you are too modest. I, I literally am going for like a Muppets voice. I, I'm, I'm, I'm apologizing. I'm all over the place with his voice. I should have thought about it more. I was an Oba. Kermit the Frog here. Let's <laughs> just go for Kermit voice. Their beds. Where my, where my daughter sleeps. Anyways. Reese didn't want to be put on a huge pedestal. He was truly an amateur compared to Zenoba and Pedagus, who were far more devoted to the fine arts. He just knew about figurines from his previous life. But even that was shadow at best. It, it, it's kind of one of those always fascinating things about this series and the idea of like something as simple as an otaku going to or shut in neat with otaku tendencies going to another another world and having that mindset of figurines and bringing it to the new world and how it's such a foreign concept in that other world that suddenly it becomes like a massive deal for anybody that's into fine arts. Here, when you present somebody with a figurine, it's typically going to be of a female character or whatever. But for most people, they're going to go, it's a toy. Because in our world, in our mindsets, that's toys predated that. It's these ideas of like action figures and stuff like that. Everybody in this world, their mindset goes to action figure toys. Whereas in this other world, they don't have that concept. Yeah, there's probably kids that have you know, a rolling donkey or something like that. So they do have a concept of toys in this world, but not the idea of figures and the idea of how they're sort of, yes, again, seen as fine art default versus a toy. At any rate, those boxes were absolutely fantastic. Even at a glance, I, they're beds. That's where my daughters sleep. Please, I would ask you to refer to them as beds. Right, beds. Then I understand. They are such fine craftsmanship that bed does seem to be more fitting for them. I am of the mind to ask you to collaborate with me at some point, so I would like to ask you to be mindful about how you speak about my girl's bed in the future. R right. <laughs> he gets really mad about that. As seen by Son Zenoba's face, he must have similarly invoked Belfry's anger this way. 
Still, he referred to them as boxes when they spoke before. Belfry was fussy, but his detail in the beds was top-notch. Zenobo was right that they might be collaborating with this man in due time. While Verdius wouldn't have need for boxes for his plan with the reserved figurines, they may need them in the future for, say, a gift to Pedagus or to sell to Osra nobility. Master Belfry, you may be an exceedingly talented artisan, but the impetus you showed my master is- It's fine, Zenoba. I see nothing wrong with his request. It's important to be particular about certain things. Zenoba frowned, as if not entirely convinced. Belfry really did consider his boxes beds for his dolls. That desire to give his dolls comfortable sleeping places was what drove his quality. Speaking of collaboration, that little figure maker of yours came to the shop the other day. Julie- Julie did? Reese couldn't shake his mental image of Julie as an inexperienced amateur, so it really threw him off hearing her referred to as a professional crafter. Still, her skills were growing immensely. Aside from the use of magic, her skills had surpassed Rudius's. By standards of this world, she was a fine maker of figures. That's odd. I haven't asked Julie to purchase anything. I must tell you, Julie, Miss Julie, she, oh, I can hardly express it. Belfried rambled on, extremely enthusiastic. Reese wondered if he was a true-born lollicon who somehow witnessed Julie doing something perverted. So bad. Reus felt like the two of them might have something in common, but he definitely didn't want him coming anywhere near his daughters in that case. It's like, yeah, I can relate, unfortunately, but stay away from my kids. What did Julie do? Zenoba narrowed his eyes in suspicion. The words, I, I am afraid I can't even find the right ones to express what happened. Belfry cried in delight. Rudius and Zenoba exchanged glances. Rudius would be handling this. He had dipped his toes in extracting information from people. He even handled an interrogation to discover a true criminal behind a robbery. <laughs> Persena, <laughs> Persena. Please, calm down and explain yourself. What exactly did Julie come here for? A figure. She brought a figure with her. A, a figure? Yes. It was one I've never seen before in my life. It was incredible. Absolutely, positively incredible. A masterpiece. Julie had shown him every single piece that she had made. Zenoba had safely tucked most of them away in a storehouse. She would need permission to take one out. However, Zenoba had mentioned she wouldn't let him see her most recent work. Ah, I can't stop myself from trembling just thinking about it. See, my hands are shaking because of the joy is so overwhelming. His hands were indeed shaking, but Rhea sent something more sinister than joy. <laughs> and I, and so I thought to myself, I need to pour these feelings, this affection, this delight into a, my own craftsmanship. Have a look for yourself. Belfry scurried over, grabbed a box. No, a bed, <laughs> as it was called here. It was white with gold decorations. Fabric lining it was a luxurious light pink that complemented the other colors perfectly. It lacked gems, but that simplicity added to its elegance. It reminded Brius of a palace canopy bed. This is the bed I made for her. I could count the number of times I've felt this creative inspiration before. That's how impactful it was. Ah, oh, this is the first time I've been able to create such a fantastic bed in only a few days time. It was impressive and easily recognized as a rare gem. Craftsmanship fit for a king. Even Pedagus would recognize its quality. Oh, Master Zenoba, I cannot believe you would tease me like that. Having your little doll maker show off a work of that caliber. Hmm, but I'm afraid I'm completely in the dark myself. Zenoba glanced to Rudius. It seemed her figure had inspired Belfried to create a bed for it on his own. The problem was that Zenoba didn't order her to do such a thing. She had done it of her own volition, but why? It, this is like the point where it's already like, as a gift. Like, I, I'm already right here. It's obviously a gift. <laughs> She's keeping it a secret because it's a gift. And then it goes into like this whole thing where the guy was trying to sell, uh, have her sell it to him. And it's like, that's even more proof. It was a gift. It wasn't that she's trying to get money to get out. It's, it's one of those moments where it's like, why immediately to the negative? Like, I, I guess it goes to Reese's mindset of always think the worst. But he's mentioned before that he likes to think of the best. So it kind of goes counter to what, I guess it's an aspect of he preaches that, but he doesn't really do that, which is technically a thing as well. Why did Julie bring that figure here? Did she say anything? I haven't the faintest idea. I got so excited the moment I saw the figure that I didn't hear what she brought it for. <laughs> though, though most people bring their adorable daughters here because they want to give them a bed. Perhaps that was her intention. Reese didn't feel it was common for people to want beds for their dolls. It seemed like a really niche interest. Could Julie be one of them? When one marries off one of their daughters, their betrothed will be much more happier having a bed to put them in. <laughs> well, of course. Marry off? Betrothed? Oh, in other words, having a box to put a doll in increases value when selling it. I guess this is where he just goes downhill. Like this right here, I guess, plants into Rudeus's head. And then it goes in the direction of, obviously, she's trying to sell it. Precisely. That was why I was hoping this one might marry into my home. I tried to purchase her for 200 Osirin gold coins. But unfortunately, your doll maker ran from me. 200 Osirin gold coins? Oh, 
Master Rudius, please don't give me that look. You must think the worst of me, trying to buy a piece of such quality for a measly 200 coins. But I swear to you, that was all I had on my person at the time. I now have 300 to offer. No, no, I'm willing to go as high as 350. It was shocking that the figure would fetch that price. But was Julie trying to sell it? Reese mumbled to himself. But why would she try to sell it? Why not? The more money, the better, no? You could never have too much. I'm more curious about what she would use it for. She's never done anything up to this point. At least, not as far as I've heard. Rius wondered if Zenoba failed to provide something to her, <laughs> which led her to need money. <laughs> Maybe Zenoba was drowning in insane debt. <laughs> Lately, her skills have improved immensely, so I've been giving her a generous wage. Rius had come up with that idea to have her paid. Zenoba was shocked at the concept of giving money to a slave, but he didn't quibble about it. Julie was working hard enough that she deserved that much. It was only natural to pay her. Hmm, yes, that's right. Master Julie is a slave, isn't she? In that case, perhaps she's trying to buy her freedom. Her freedom? Indeed. Slaves were generally bought and sold for coin, purchased in one place and auctioned elsewhere. Their individual rights differed based on the country that they were in and who owned them. This is some, again, it's a, it's a sad reality of that world, but it is interesting to kind of get into it. And this sort of makes sense. This is sort of a thing really in any world, or our world, any world, <laughs> our world, any country. Um, it, it just difference in every different location, how much freedoms they have, and yes, how much protections they can have. There was some countries that prioritized proper treatment of slaves, and others were far less concerned about it. And I would probably argue, I don't know they've actually mentioned this, but it would make sense, honestly. It would probably also depend on what race they are. Like, if you can have some area that doesn't really care, I'm Millis is a good example. The holy country of Millis. There would probably be a lot of cases there where demon slaves would probably be not really seen as human. So it'd be probably more of an idea of there being some sort of human rights, even up for a slave. But those human rights don't apply to demons because they don't see them as humans. It was rather easy to become a slave. If you didn't have money, then you could sell yourself off. Here's that kind of like uncomfortable truths that I always love this writer having. There was many people who'd rather become someone else's belongings than die. That was especially true in the Northern Territories. On top of its difficult climate, the people living there were mostly impoverished. If someone couldn't find work, they risked starvation or death by hyperthermia. On top of that, it was actually fairly easy to quit, at least in theory. Since a slave was sold for money, they could also be bought with money. One could save up coin and purchase themselves to be free after that. The amount required depended on the country of residence, years as a slave, and how much money that had been spent on them. There was even some nations where slaves weren't allowed to have wages. So again, it just depends on where you're at. In some regions, like the buildup to it and the process of getting out of it and what rights you have are all going to be different. And that makes perfect sense because, again, some countries are going to see that it is a necessity. Some countries are going to have people that don't like the idea that it exists. And some countries are going to see that, yeah, they're less than human. They are a belonging or whatever. And yes, in some cases, a belonging that itself can purchase own belongings. <laughs> a, a belonging that has sentience to buy its own self. So yeah, it, kind of interesting to have, yes, in some regions, especially the North, I could totally see that being the case. If you're up there, and they, they've talked several times that a lot of the money that's coming into the Northern region, because it's like got snow so often, yeah, crops and whatnot are going to be very difficult to cultivate there. So you have people fighting over land, and yes, mostly where you have a lot of the riches is going to be in Renoa, where yes, they are getting into magic and magical implements and all this other kind of stuff and research that they're selling out. The magic bricks, the magic resistant bricks, all that kind of stuff technically does bring that money. But outside of there, if you're some random village and you have no way of making money, you're starving, okay, I'm going to die or I can sell myself and hopefully the person that buys me takes care of me. It's basically like selling yourself into a employment. That's sort of what, sort of how he's putting it here, is because you can't get a job, you're going to starve. You sell yourself into employment, and thus you're becoming a full-time employee that probably isn't going to get paid at all. But because you are an asset, because you're going to be doing something, your owner, in I would assume most cases, is going to give you food so that you can keep working. They paid money to buy you, why would they not feed you so that you can keep doing the thing that they bought you for? So it is a way of at least avoiding death. And some people can see that as something they would want because they don't have welfare in this world, I would assume. There might, there might be a country that has it, maybe meals or something. There's no welfare or anything like that. Everybody's out for numero uno. So 
unless you can find some sort of outreach or something to survive, they've not even indicated – they've indicated there has been uh, cases of, like, um, orphanages. And that was really around the whole uh, Volume 7, talking about how the ladies of the brothel were sort of taking care of the homeless kids. But not really in too much detail about there being some sort of organization that helps people that are, you know, hurting or homeless or whatever. So it is technically an unfortunate option that they can choose to do. And it is actually interesting to have some countries actually allow the idea that they can buy themselves out of it. Because there is an out for it, at least. Again, I like the fact that he's willing to talk about it because this is actually some interesting stuff, as much as I don't want it to exist. They got Julie for a ridiculously low price. Although they had taught her a number of skills, she could easily buy her freedom with 200 Austrian gold coins and still have some cash left over. Not that he really wanted to let her go, mind you. There was something more important that was bothering him. I cannot believe she would do such a thing without speaking to me first. Zenoba dropped his gaze, a shadow falling on his face. Ryu's can understand his shock, though. They did the best they could for Julie. She was in a horrific state when they bought her, but they gave her food, clothes, warm place to stay, education, and practical skills. They even gave her a wage. They had bought her because Zenoba was a blessed child that couldn't create art for himself, and Reese had plans for her to mass-produce reserved figurines. While they had been strict with her, hoping she would fulfill her goals, they were never cruel to her. And yes, I can see you arguing the idea that it, even if they do treat her well, her not having freedom to not do what they want her to do, is an argument you can make there, but again, they've never implied that they would never allow her to have that freedom. And they'd even express that in this chapter. Of course, if Julie wanted to be free, Rudius would release her. That didn't lessen the shock of finding out that she was going behind their backs to get the funds to do so though. It was like she didn't trust them at all. Yeah, and I can see that being the hurt there, obviously. Again, I don't, I, there, there was no side of me that thought this is the direction it was gonna go. No. Being a slave was no walk in the park. Ruiz had never been a slave before, so it wasn't right for him to belittle the struggles they faced. Having seen Linnea's predicament for himself, it was much easier for him to imagine what some of them went through. Anyone would be stressed out by not having true personal freedom. They couldn't really say what was on their mind or the things they wanted to. That is a very good point. I like that he acknowledged that. Despite the fact that we've done everything for Julie, um, tried to make her as happy as possible, gave her all of this stuff, you know, prevented her from dying, really. But that doesn't change the fact that she could, despite all this, beside, be, despite being given everything, could still not want that. I thought we'd done right by her, but I guess maybe it was too hard on her being a slave this whole time. Julie had only recently started transitioning to adulthood. Perhaps that led her to contemplate her future more seriously. No doubt she found herself faced with a number of worries. Was it really okay to keep her making figurines as she has been? What would happen in her future? It was also possible that she'd grown fearful of being a grown man slave. Now that her body started to mature. Th I guess that's a question mark is what she believes there. I mean, we're going to get into quite a bit of her perspective. Not really her perspective, but a third person of her perspective uh, in a minute. But yeah, the, the question mark does come up of, like I said before, it's a struggle to really think about because she's technically growing up in a situation that I thankfully have never experienced. So I don't know if her mind develops seeing her own personal space differently. I can see somebody that has grown from a point of being a child, you know, to at least, you know, being a teenager around men that have control over her, how that can warp how she views her own personal self. But would she see Zenoba and be fearful as a female? Yeah, I guess if seeing him rubbing on a statue, possibly walking in on him rubbing on a statue butt naked, you can get that. But there also is a thing of, that's him. Rudius has not been with Zenoba for very long, and he knows that that is the case with Zenoba. He likes his figurines more. He's If he sees two naked things in front of him, one's a statue and one's a female, he's going to jump on the statue. That's Zenoba. But so would she be fearful in that regard. I don't know that would, be, that would be the case. Regardless of how much of a gentleman Zenoba was, given their master-servant relationship, Zenoba showed little hesitation over stripping her, much like he had during her period not long ago. Julie might still be young, but that still had to be embarrassing and scary for her. But if that's the case, what will happen to our dreams? You have paid no small sum yourself to help raise her, haven't you, master? Roos paid little compared to Zenoba's investment. In fact, he was a little worried thinking about how much he poured into her development. It wasn't just gold, it was time and effort. Now I can see that being like a very nasty, like clip that out of context and that sounds really mean, 
But I think it is more of an aspect of, yeah, I technically spent all this time. It, it's like the idea of having a daughter or a son and you just raising them and teaching them a lot of things. And then out of nowhere, they just walk out the door, not even saying goodbye. And they literally have a look on their face like they never wanted to be with you. That, yeah, can hurt. That can hurt quite a bit. Yes, in the context of him talking about money investment, it sort of does more put it in the idea that, yes, time is money. And even though he didn't give much money into uh, Julie's process, he gave her time, sat down with her, taught her things. Whatever the case, Julie is a person like anyone else. If she's eager to free herself, then I don't feel it's our place to stop her. Zenoba grunted and crossed his arms, still anxious. It was probably difficult for him to come to terms with it. Despite Ruiz's stance to let her go, it wouldn't be easy for him to give up on his figures. Ruiz wondered how to convince him. Thanks to Zelf Gauntlet, he had fine motor skills to not crush things now. And even if he did let Julie go, he could commission her for work. Again, it's one of those moments where I think he think he he thinks so little of Zenoba sometimes. As Rudius thought to himself, Zenoba turned to him, reaching his decision. You are right. Julie has worked hard under her care. Perhaps the least we could do was grant her whatever she wishes. That was a little unexpected. Knowing Zenoba, Rudius figured that he would refuse to back down. Again, Rudius, I don't think you even know him. <laughs> as much as Zenoba is a bro, Rudius, you do not know your bro. How dare you, Rudius? After all, this meant losing the person who had been doing her utmost to make figures for him every day. It seemed even with his strong penchant for dolls, he couldn't treat her like a machine after living with her for so long. He'd even given her a name similar to his little brother's. Well, let's go back for now. We should ask Julie what her intentions really are. At this point, they were only jumping to conclusions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> bad conclusions, dude. You guys are going down a rabbit hole or it's just, just completely off base. The most important thing was what Julie wanted. If she really was intending to free herself, Without saying a word to Zenoba, Ruiz would be giving her a good talking to. He understood that it wasn't an easy topic to bring up, but some things needed communication. That part I do agree with, if that was the case, but it's not the case. Thus they went to Zenoba's room. Belfried came along with them, because he wanted to see the figurine one more time. But Ruiz wasn't buying it. His pockets was jingling from coins. Clearly, he was there to buy it. Still, Ruiz didn't think Zenoba would part with something as phenomenal as Belfried claimed. Yeah, that's for sure. Unless they had different tastes. I have returned. Zenoba declared, thrusting open the door without bothering to knock. Welcome back, master. Julie came dashing out of one of the inner rooms. She had a steel knife in her hand. She used a chisel stone. Apparently, she wasn't using her workbench in the main room and was practicing somewhere else. Or perhaps she was hiding it. Zenoba must have realized the same thing. Julie, on the other hand, showed no signs of being panicked by their sudden return. She actually seemed more delighted than Ruiz had seen her before. If she was really plotting to buy her own freedom and escape behind Zenoba's back, then being able to smile this innocently was impressive. Well, unsettling. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the first sign already that it's not the case. Women could be scary sometimes. <laughs> Upon noticing Belfried, Julie's face clouded over before retreating a step in panic. It made Rudius think that she realized someone privy to her secret was now here. Hey there, Julie. Thank you for coming over the other day. Belfried grinned ghoulishly at her. A shudder ran through Julie, and she shot an entreating look at Zenoba, as if begging for help. Zenoba hummed under his breath and started towards her. He crossed the gap between them in no time and stared down at her. Julie glanced anxiously at him, waiting. Julie, do you wish to stop being my slave? Her eyes shot wide open. I'm already getting emotional, damn it. <laughs> I hate this so much. I hate misunderstandings like this. I'm fine with misunderstandings. I think it can be funny in times, but it's like... Whenever it involves, especially a kid like this, it's just like, oh, this hurts so freaking much. Mainly because with a kid, it can be so much more detrimental. It can be much more impactful. That loss of trust there is, is painful. Chapter 11, The Other Slave, Part 2. This, this is where it gets so rough. Oof, this is where it gets so rough. <laughs> Hopefully I don't cry. Half of Juliet's life had been stained with the despair. She was born to a dwarven couple and literally gave the name the Child of Bazaar of the Holy Still and Lilitella of the Beautiful Snow Ridge. So basically her name is her parents plus titles. <laughs> but then what do they name the second child? Is it the second child of Bazaar of the Holy Still and Lilitella of the Beautiful Snow Ridge? And then the third child and the fifth child and the 26th child of Bazaar. <laughs> In dwarven custom, 
Children were not given names until they reached seven, so there was nothing strange about her not having one of her own. Back then, Juliet's parents referred to her as our baby or our beloved girl. Julie thought nothing of it. Oh well, yeah, I mean, you, if you're raised that way, that's just how it is. <laughs> Again, that goes that idea of like, if, if this is your only experience, then it's normal. Her parents, Bazaar, Bazaar, Bazaar? Is it Bazaar Bazaar? Bazaar? It seems like it's Bazaar. I'm probably going to say Bazaar again later on, but I'll try to say Bazaar. It just depends on which language it's from anyways. Her parents, Bezar and Lilitella, were a little different than other dwarves. Most dwarves lived on the mill's continent, in the southern part of the great forest along the mountains. They spent their time mining ore and using it to craft weapons, which were used for hunting or sold to buy food. They were a rather simple race in that way. Julie's parents, however, made their lot by traveling the world and crafting weapons and adornments in each region they visited. Julie didn't know the reason why they decided to leave their homeland to become nomads. Perhaps they had a good reason, or merely youthful indulgence. Whatever the case, one thing was readily apparent. The life they had chosen wasn't easy. Worse yet, they were already on the brink of bankruptcy when Julie was born. They dug themselves into further debt, paying back their debts they owed. They got to the point where they couldn't keep up with interest. Their craftsmanship wasn't lacking. They just didn't have the business acumen or foresight to use their talents. They thought if they made a good product, people would be willing to buy it. They took up loans for top quality materials and tried to sell the products. With no buyers willing to purchase from a roadside shop, it took too long to sell. It was impressive how they managed to live like that for so many years. This was only because they figured out how to be self-sufficient. At times, they even resorted to cunning means to keep afloat, such as defaulting on smaller debts by skipping town. For several years, the couple were desperate to scrape together a living, and there was definitely nothing enjoyable about it for them. Julie's earliest memory was of her lying in a bed, watching her parents hunched over. Their backs turned to her as they worked on crafting something. They had their foreheads nearly pressed together as they fiddled with something in their hands. A cool breeze came through the crack in Julie's room and caressed her cheek. She cried out. Lily Tella smiled reluctantly as she hurried over and cradled her in her arms. The way they looked was engraved in Julie's mind even now. The tears threatening to well in Lily Tella's eyes. The dark and guilty look on Bezar's face. Julie couldn't recall ever seeing them smile. A few years later, her parents finally crumbled under their debt. They had skipped out on so many repayments that the loan sharks put them on the blacklist. It made it impossible to borrow from anyone. Without the means to buy materials, they had no way of making a living as it was winter in the Northern Territories at that point. Their only choice were to die as a family or live on as slaves. They chose the latter. Again, there's a, a good example of that idea. They pushed something, they took a lot of money and it came down to die or live under somebody else's care, essentially, they chose that. So it's, again, it's like a, it's a grim reality of the world itself. But it is interesting, they were in the Northern Territories. Like the assumption at the time when they first uh, brought Julie into the picture was that, well, all the dwarves are down there in the Mills continent, so what if that uh, apply, that makes me believe that they were doing stuff down there, they screwed up, and then they were just brought to the Northern Territories at some point, uh, but no, they were actually in the Northern Territories when it happened. Traveling, of course. Which does kind of make me wonder, why would you go to the Northern Territories without, like, a concrete plan? Because, <laughs> I mean, that seems like it would be uh, the obvious thing there if you had any knowledge of how the trade system works or the slave trade system works. Or the Northern Territory in general, is that you would make sure that you at least have a plan before you go up there. Because it's going to be harder to get some materials and food and whatnot. Despite tough circumstances, Bezar and Lilitella were probably more fortunate than most. Dwarves had strong constitutions, and since Bezar was a skilled smith, he found a buyer quickly. Lilitella didn't have to wait long either. She was skilled with her hands, could create beautiful adornments, repair objects and clothing, and had experience in looking after children. Neither of them would die, even if they were ripped apart from each other. Julie, however, was the most misfortuned of their family. Yeah! I guess that technically does open the door to the idea that eventually she could run into her parents. I'd be very curious if that actually happens. And would she care? I, I think that's probably my biggest question mark is, what is her feelings of her parents? Does she hate her parents for do, making that decision? I, I really do, at this point, kind of thinking about this more, I kind of do want, I do kind of hope for that. It doesn't, not that it has to happen, but it would be interesting to see her at some point come across her parents. And that might actually happen with her um, getting more and more into making these figurines. Basically, again, building an entire manufacturing program and everything for the reserve figurines and anything else. She could actually get very much so high in some sort of group. Like, eventually, they're going to have to mass produce, which, what, what does mass producing mean? 
getting more people to do the work. Somebody has to oversee them. And I can see Julie being the best person for that because she's crafted them for so long. She can oversee a lot of people and say a, a factory or something like that and telling them what they're doing wrong or what they need to do. And eventually through that process, yeah, what's to say that eventually when she's got a warehouse or something, somebody shows up. Somebody commissions their their slave to come in there and it ends up being her mother or whatever. And again, my biggest question mark is does she hate her parents for making that decision? There's a side of me that believes that she does. That she would hate them at this point right here. That she would hate them not because they made that decision but because she suffered for so long. She was really wanting death. And I, I would be curious if she would understand what she went through or because she was so young when she was brought into that trade – that she never really understands, so she never built that hatred for her parents. Too young to be of use. She was hardly even able to speak at her age. She filled no one's needs, and there was no buyers to take her. Day after day, she stood at the edge of the market, staring down at her feet. Even the slavers were growing more troubled over what to do with her. Slaves were still people, like anyone else, which meant that the slavers had to feed them, give them a warm place to sleep, and make sure they stayed healthy. <laughs> I, when I read that part, I'm like, Fail at that. <laughs> Fail at that. But again, I think that's one of those, that's one of those things where, especially with this particular region, is that because they're people like anyone else, they had to feed them, give them a warm place to sleep. Is it because of the restrictions or because she is an item they had to pay for? And so they don't want her to wither away because then that's just them burning money. And I think it might more so be the latter. Not there's rules against them mistreating their slaves, but more so because their product, you need to make sure that product still has value. And if it dies, it has no value. And thus that would mean that yes, technically at some point they're going to stop wanting to put money into that product because it's becoming a net loss, which is again, sad, but it's the unfortunate truth. Uncomfortable truths. The one lucky thing was that their parents managed to sell themselves to slaver for burrito. It sounds like Febreze and burrito put together. <laughs> sorry, that's the way that I pronounce that. It's literally what it sounded like. I'm sorry if your name is Febrito. Febrito? Probably Febrito. Who was one of the biggest slavers in the trade? He had secured himself a prominent spot in the market and had a reputation for quality merchandise. That was why they kept Julie and looked after her even though she failed to attract buyers instead of tossing her to the side on some road. That's where her luck ended though. Even Fabrito didn't have the luxury of caring about what he considered defective goods in a warehouse. His treatment of Julie gradually grew sloppier until he gave up on dragging her out to the sales floor altogether. This is where I'm kind of, it kind of jumped in my mind the idea of with how, I, with how common I could see this totally being, yes, there's going to be some people in any world, unfortunately, that is going to be probably more than happy to buy any children for unfortunately disgusting things. But what immediately popped my head here is similar to what I was talking about earlier, where I don't think they've ever indicated there's any sort of systems or groups that tries to build orphanages. Again, I, I don't recall them ever mentioning an orphanage in this entire series so far, except for, again, those brothel ladies taking care of the girls, or the, the homeless kids. With what Rudius eventually wants to do, it kind of makes more sense to me that with Rudius and how much money he seems to be throwing out other things, that he could possibly invest that money into building his own orphanages for, yes, a benefit of his own. Yes, buying up all these kids that are sitting in these cages probably dying, or, again, finding any kids that are maybe possibly their parents or themselves are considering selling themselves into that industry. Swipe them all up. Give them an orphanage, a place to stay, a place to live, warm beds, fed, and yeah, teach them magic on the side. And then they can, whenever they want, or they can, they can help the, the orphanage by crafting figurines. It gives them something to do. They enjoy that. They're fed and everything. And yes, when they get old enough, they can leave. But it would be a cool way to sort of benefit society while also at the same time getting some sort of benefit out of it which is not unheard of there's a lot of orphanages that will have the children do tasks in order to help the orphanage survive not that they're cracking a whip at them despite how young she was julie knew no one needed her she also knew that her parents had abandoned her worse she knew that she would probably suffer in that cage until death took her that sucks because she's seeing it as her parents abandoned her, which is technically true because in selling themselves to the slave trade, they know full well they're going to get separated. And it's that sad reality of 
but if they don't sell themselves, she's going to die. So it's like it's an abandonment, but at the same time, it's it's helping her survive. She'll die otherwise. And yes, there could be more of an idea of them just wanting to save themselves. But again, more tragic in the idea that she just knows nobody needs me. I'm going to die here. Just waiting for that death. Julie wasn't particularly bothered about the idea of her life ending. None of her memories were anything good. She was born to poverty and spent her entire life with an ache in her belly. Her meals were soup with bitter grass and meat on the verge of rotting. She tried her best not to get in her parents' way. Loitering in the corner and spacing out every day was as bland and meaningless as the last. The only decent memory was when her parents managed to make a decent coin. Her father let her have a sip of alcohol at the time. It was an atrocious grog mixed with all sorts of things. But as a dwarf, it was delicious. That's the only, only decent memory that she's ever had with them. Julie had no desire to live. Didn't dream of finding happiness. She had no idea how that might even happen. That was why, when those two men appear before her, she couldn't picture anything good coming from it. In fact, she was positive. Something new and awful was on the horizon. Oh, this hurts again. <laughs> why do we have to go through this again? Why do we have to go through this again? Do you want to live anymore? He said. Yes. That's exactly what she wanted to. To die. If it's that bad... Should I just end it for you? A part of her felt relieved. Finally, it was over. No more cold. No more hunger. Her dark life would come to an end. The man asking her had a blank expression. He was so utterly unreadable that she got the impression he meant it. That if she'd nodded, he'd take her life easily and quickly as he breathed. His eyes were far too serious to be a joke. But the more she studied them the more something strange bottled up inside her. It was almost like he was really trying to say, you have enough life left in you to give it another shot, don't you? Of course, if he actually said that, she would probably have shaken her head and insisted she couldn't go on, but he didn't say a word. It wasn't like Julie didn't consider it as an option. It was simply that the following words just passed through her lips unbidden. I don't want to die. Nothing in her memories made her actively want to live. But it wasn't as though she truly wanted to die. That's right. She didn't want to die. Okay. <laughs> First of all, yes, this is um a lot less a lot less painful the second time around because I'm not I know what I'm coming up to. It makes sense because this is kind of the expected aspect of coming through this this perspective is this is the assumed thing here. That she was stuck in that cage for that long, and yes, sick and, and malnourished and freezing and dying. She was literally, it seemed like she was on her last leg. And then Rudius and them come up there and get that option. Again, this is the cool part of this segment, is getting, yes, from a third-person perspective here, what she was thinking about at that time. He comes up to me, he says, do you want to die? And she's like, well, yeah. Sounds great. Put an end to it. I want to die. Go ahead. Do it. But then she sees in his expression, or at least sees that he's really kind of asking, you got enough in there. Why not give it another shot? She's, and I guess this kind of goes to Rudius when, if I remember correctly, when Rudius, in, from his perspective in this situation, he's literally going, I see her in me. I see that face that I had looking in that mirror in my previous life. I wanted it to end. It wasn't going to work. And yes, in his mind, he was turning it to, there's a good chance that if I, if she agrees and I send her off and I, I, and I end her life, she might be lucky like me and get another shot at life. And in that life, it hopefully will be better for her. But I think what it's sort of drawing a conclusion here is because she seen him while he was thinking about that, it seemed like he was, uh, she was reading from him, you got enough to give another shot. That's sort of an odd thing there. It makes me want to go back and actually reread that segment, but it is an oddity that she takes that from that. She takes something from him. And I think that might be from a perspective of her seeing, I guess, in his face, I got another shot and look at me now. I'm so much, me as Rudius, I'm so much more happier now. I got a second shot. 
I was given that second chance. And so she could read that as I can I can fix this. Because he had because he got that second chance. Not that she knows that he had another life. The f- but the fact that he gave it he had enough that he gave it a second chance and now he's happy. Maybe I can do that too. Maybe I can give it a second shot. And that I I believe that was technically in his mind as well as the idea of she could do this again. I think he mentioned the idea that um, I can take her out of here and I can clean her up and everything, but if she doesn't want to do it, it, it's not going to work. She's got to want that next chance, that next life. She's got to make that decision. So again, maybe she read that from that, that thought process. After they washed her body of all the grime, put her in expensive clothes like she'd never worn and fed her the most delicious food that she had in her whole life, they finally said, from the day onward, your name will be Juliet. They had given her a name. Hearing it, she smiled. Julie didn't even know why she had done it, but she did. It was only afterwards, upon reflection, she realized that she'd finally felt like all that misery she'd experienced in her life was at an end. Her smile then must have been from relief, or so she thought. Life as a slave was far different from what she had imagined. Granted, her imagination was limited due to her narrow life experience, but she had heard how the other slaves in the slave house lamented what happened to them. She naturally expected her despair to continue. She spent her days looking after Zenoba and learning earth magic so she could make figurines. There were so many things that she had to remember. So many orders rained upon her. And if she didn't adhere to those rules and keep promises she made, they get angry with her. It was tough work for someone so young. It didn't help that she was a slave at the university. The other students treated her poorly when Zenoba wasn't watching. Even so, she experienced worse before being sold into slavery. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of a pretty rough starting point. It's like it's kind of all uphill from there, unfortunately. And fortunately, they kept her fed, let her use warm water for baths, and gave her a cozy place to sleep. Most importantly, her master Zenoba was incredibly kind to her. He might get angry, but he would never yell at her. He was always extremely patient and made himself absolutely clear when communicating, despite not sharing a common tongue in the beginning. You don't belong to me, he would say. You are my master's slave. That was a phrase he repeated the first few months that she lived with him. Honestly, he probably believed it. To him, Julie was simply on loan. That was why he was so polite to her. Not as he would with a guest, perhaps, but more like he would be to a servant or maid. Julie was a hopeless mess on her own and couldn't do anything. But Zenoba never looked down on her for it. He taught her every single thing that she knew. How to clean, how to look after figurines and dolls, how to do laundry, how to keep dolls and figurines organized. How to, do, how to fold clothing. Proper table matters. How to wash figurines and dolls. I love how it kind of keeps going back and forth. Oh, figurines. This and figurines. And this and figurines. That's right. Yeah, it keeps, it keeps talking about figurines. But no, it was interesting right here. Because again, this shows like where even Julie herself noticed that Zenoba was, was treating her as she belonged to his master. And I think that's a, a good sign of that. Is every time there's a discussion about Julie... And what her future is, especially early on, this topic came up a lot. It was always this thing where Rhea's is like, I think this should be the case. And Zenoba would protest here and there. But for the most part, he's like, whatever master wants. Because again, in his eyes, she belongs to my master, even though I did this. And there's another side of me that like believes that around here where she's talking about the idea of whenever she did something wrong, he wouldn't like jump down her throat. I think that there might be a side of that that, yes, it is because I can't touch this thing because it belongs to my master. But I think there's also a side of it that he sees that I can't do any better. <laughs> well, like, especially if it comes to making the figurines, I, I, Zenoba can't do it. And she's doing much better than he can. There, there, it, there probably is a side of that of jealousy. Like, I wish I can do that, but she can do it. So I can't argue if she messes up. But again, I think a lot of it is the fact that he truly believe that Julie belonged to his master. And I like how she kind of puts it in the idea of how somebody treats a maid or a servant, because that makes perfect sense. That's the idea that if you went to somebody else's house in this world, if you went to somebody else's house and they had a maid, yes, you wouldn't see the maid as being like an equal because they're a maid or a servant, but you treat them properly. You don't treat them as a slave where you would be like, oh, you put down the, the cup wrong, slap. It would be more of an idea of like, oh, you put down the cup wrong. You must have been trained incorrectly or whatever. It's like a completely different mindset because you sort of elevate. Again, I'm acknowledging this is a sad reality. You elevate their worth in society. They're no longer just 
basically inhuman in a way to being, okay, well, they're being paid for it. They're under service, under a contract that they can walk away from. Again, they're they're almost seen as, yes, a poor human, but a human. Zenobo was pretty independent, despite being royalty. Thanks to that, Julie learned to look after him in no time at all. She then had to learn language and skill of her craft. Rudius was the one primarily responsible for teaching her that, and he never lost his patience with her, even when she struggled to retain vocabulary or grammar, and she shrunk in fear of his reproach. He kept his voice calm and kindly tried to figure out what was giving her difficulty. He was strict in his own way, however, having her repeat the same thing over for days until it stuck. To be frank, Julie wasn't too fond of Rudius in the beginning, partly because he resembled the villain in a fairy tale her parents told her. <laughs> We're going to bring that back up. But partly because his words from when they first met left a lasting impact. <laughs> I got to bring up the, the monster again. <laughs> but no, that, that's an interesting again. It's one of those side effects of everything is that, yes, technically from Rius's perspective, we got a really quick hint. Yes, technically him asking Zenoba of why she feared him after that whole thing with Lenny and Priscilla. But this is showing that, yes, even from that first encounter with him, she had a fear of him. And like she, said, she puts here, she knew that he could end everything at the drop of a hat. If it suited him, he could rip her from the life that she had grown accustomed to. And it even compounds on itself. And the idea that when he first met me, he put his hand on my throat and said, do you want me to end it? Do you want to end this all? And at that point, again, she was going to accept it, but then she chose to, to live. But that ingrained in her mind stayed there. Not because he would be willing to do that. Because in her mind, he was so willing to destroy her just by her saying, yes, do it. He would probably be willing to do that if she would ever step down a line or was unuseful. That's the mind of somebody who has been bought into some sort of work. No matter if she's comfortable, no matter if she's happy, no matter if she's being fed, no matter if she's being taught and she's experienced new things, no matter if she's warm, that makes it worse. Because now she's, like she says, grown accustomed to it. I'm now comfortable. I'm okay. But he could take it from me. Because he was willing to back then, it shows how willing he is to do that. It's a side effect to literally what he thought was a good thing to say. It's tragic. <laughs> that thought made it difficult to relax around him. Fortunately, that feeling soon faded. Rudius didn't do anything to her, even when she failed to meet his expectations. In fact, he actually showed her a great consideration and smiled at her. Any anxiousness she felt gradually receded until she was fully comfortable around him. So we established that she's finally in that position, I guess. That's a good thing. Zenobo is probably responsible for that as well. He always ate meals with her, slept nearby, and whenever she got sick, injured, or felt off, he would immediately rush to fetch a Rudius or a healer. <laughs> a Rudius? <laughs> to fetch a Rudius? I'm not going to look that one up because that could just be... It, it is technically third person, so it shouldn't be from her mind, but I could see like a childish way of thinking that, fetching a Rudius. Or maybe even uh, Zenobo's like, oh, I gotta go fetch a... No, Zenobo would say I gotta go fetch Master, so that couldn't be it. But <laughs> fetch a... <U> <laughs> Fetch a Rudius or a healer. <laughs> when she experienced her first period the other day, he tried his best to be there for her. Even though he had no idea what he was doing, panicking and fretting at a total loss, Zenoba had truly treated her as if she was his little sister. <laughs> so cute. I like that she acknowledged that, but it makes sense because that's what she said. Please, master, don't leave me. She was calling out to Zenoba. Please don't leave me. I'm scared. <laughs> Julie actually had no idea if he actually had any siblings or, if he did, what kind of people they were. Zenoba never spoke to her about his family, flagging it already right here, flagging the next chapter already. <laughs> On the other hand, Zenoba gushed daily about whatever figurines or dolls he'd spot at the market. He always looked genuinely happy when he did so. Perhaps he'd never had someone to share his hobby with before. That's why he loves Rudius so much. <laughs> That's why he loved Rudius so much. Which I think is honestly kind of copying over to here. With Julie at his side, why he probably cares about her so much is that she's creating the thing that he loves so much, and she's a part of that. Not so much that she's giving him figurines, but that she's with him in that process. But it was also natural for someone to enjoy talking about their passions. Julie guessed that the reason why he hadn't spoke about his house or family was because it wasn't an enjoyable conversation for him. She felt the same. Here's where we get into that. She didn't really want to remember what her life was like before she became a slave. Which again, makes me wonder, 
Yes, she doesn't want to think about that time, but what about before then? Does she hate her parents is a massive question mark that I have. Sonova spent each night and sometimes the afternoons babbling on about dolls and figures. He had a great breadth of knowledge across a variety of fields, all of it accurate and precise. Thanks to him, she gradually became more learned as well. Every time she showed off her skills or knowledge she had learned, Zenobo would be pleased and praise her, which made her even more eager to study. <laughs> this is where it's already solidifying, dude, she's not trying to get away from you. She's not trying to... Now, okay, again, my, my thought process here, from the very get-go, I was like, no, she's, she's making you a figurine. She's trying to make you a gift, obviously. And then when they were getting into the idea of her wanting to buy her freedom, I'm like, no, I don't see... I just don't see that. Though I will say, I don't know if it was before here or right here, but somewhere from here back, at some point, there was a side of me that believed that there could be a possibility that she did want to buy her freedom, but not because she wanted to get away from Zenoba and Rudius, but maybe possibly because one of two things. She wanted to buy her freedom so that she no longer had that fear of like, I am their slave. They don't like me just because of that. And then she can sort of not be their equal. That's an impossibility because Zenoba's basically still a prince. <laughs> He's still a prince. But not be a slave, at least. But there's another side of it that, yeah, I wonder if it's an idea of maybe people around making comments about her being their slave. She could have felt herself um, being sort of a stain upon them. Like they're treating Julie so well, but she's a slave. And yes, all those comments could possibly force her to want to remove that status from her so that it makes them look better. But I don't see that being the case because in the society, being a slave doesn't make the owner look bad. It makes them look like they're actually established. They have money because they can have that. But yeah, there was a side of me that was sort of starting to think that it was a possibility that she wanted to buy her freedom just simply so that she could no longer be a slave. I guess to remove that idea that she's only doing it because she's a slave. Like there is a possibility that there, she could have heard Zenoba or Rudia say something to the effect of she's only doing it because she's a slave or whatever, but to show her devotion to still be with them even after losing that. But again, I don't think that would be the mindset of a slave. I don't, I don't see that that coming to mind. But it was an interesting kind of thought process. It's an interesting rabbit hole. Like I said, it, that's why I like this kind of topic is that you can, dis, you can explore this mindset. And again, I argue that it's good for society to never forget that it is a thing. That way you don't keep doing it. Ginger was strict with Julie when she arrived, particularly when it came to etiquette, clothing, and manner of speech. Julie's life didn't really change that much despite this, especially since Ginger didn't treat Julie like a slave. She regarded her as a colleague serving Zenoba. I can see that. Yes, she was very quick to, to, to correct her, like you're not talking properly around master. <laughs> but she's going to see her as, yes, an equal. As the day went on, Julie found something precious of her own, her work making figurines. It certainly wasn't a job that she'd wished for. It was only something that she started because, as a slave, her master had ordered her to do it. If she was honest with herself, however, it was pretty fun. I like that idea that she, to at least finally get a confirmation that this is something that she enjoys doing. Again, it wasn't something that she wished to do. It wasn't something that she was out to do. It wasn't like when she was in that cage, she's like, man, I wish somebody would pick me up so that I can make figurines for the rest of my life. No, it was one thing where she's like, oh, you want me to do this? Okay. And eventually she started liking it. And I think there is a part of that because of Zenoba's praise. Because he praised her for it, that felt good. Just like, learn, like she mentioned earlier, just the idea of her learning knowledge about figurines and then expressing that knowledge and him getting excited about it. Zenobo was frankly terrible when it came to the craft aspects of figurines, but he taught her whatever he could and provided the tools that she needed for them. That's how she slowly built up her skill set, one new technique at a time. The more she improved, the better she could make things, exactly how she envisioned them in her head. Zenobo was unerringly delighted whenever she completed a figure, <laughs> but on occasion where she excelled, he didn't shower her with mere praise, but allowed her to drink fine alcohol as well. As a dwarf, Alcohol was like life's nectar to her. It heated her body and made her heart feel light and airy. It made the dark memories from her early childhood grow dim enough that she could really bask in how enjoyable the present moment was. Those feelings transformed into energy needed to keep working hard each day and provide the motivation to start on a new figurine. It brought Julie a great deal of delight to feel her skills improve and to see her creations bring someone else joy. It was the first time she'd ever experienced such a thing, and it helped her devote herself to figure making. Again, a positive reinforcement 
she's kind of – after some point, you kind of just – you, you desire it. She poured all of her effort into figurines to show Zenoba. He was normally overjoyed, although he would sometimes offer strict criticism. When that happened, she would make the next one with greater care, devising ways to improve on her past failures. Sometimes the end product would be a little better, and sometimes it would be a little worse. So past the days, thus, over and over. Julie's life was peaceful and enjoyable, and she was grateful to Rudius and Zenoba for providing her that. She earnestly prayed she could continue being with them forever, making her figurines as she did. At some point, making those figurines had transformed into her very identity. Yeah, I, I think that sort of points out the idea of the positive and negative here. On one hand, yes, she went from death, basically, to having purpose, to having joy. And being stuck in this kind of area where I want to keep doing this forever because this is the first time she's experienced joy. But yes, there is the argument that there is, there's also an aspect that is because she hasn't been given any other option. Or at least it's not like they went, hey, Julie, you want to do this? Hey, Julie... Go out there for a day and, and see if you can find something else that you would actually find more enjoyable. So there is kind of a counterbalance to it, but it is still kind of happy to see that as a joy for her. On an ordinary day, among the many happy ones that she has spent in Shariah, Julie finished a figurine just as she always did. However, this one was a little different. Nothing dramatic, of course, just a small difference. Naturally, she made it using the techniques that she did on the others. She conjured the base of the figurine with earth magic and chiseled away the excess until it had a uniform size. Then she used her knife to perfect the shape, while her magic took care of polishing the rest. That was her regular process. This time, however, she knows something was off once it was finished. Or rather, there was nothing off about the figurine at all. That was exactly what bothered her. The figurine was practically perfect. Her skills were still only intermediate level, so ordinarily, she'd flub something in the process. It was only natural. These figurines weren't life-size figures of people, but miniatures that didn't maintain the exact proportions or anatomy. And yet, this one lacked any of those expected flaws. It was well-balanced. The arms and legs had natural curves. The surface was cleanly polished, and even the intricate details were crafted or carefully tweaked to perfection. More importantly, you could tell with a single, cursory glance that this figure was gorgeous. Julie had no idea what in particular caused it. But she remembered this particular sensation. When Zenoba showed her figurines he kept carefully stowed away in the very back of his dorm storage area, she had felt something similar. Simply put, they were masterpieces. When Julie realized what she was feeling, something indescribable bubbled up in the pit of her stomach, an emotion she couldn't put a name to. She never dreamed she would be able to create something like this. She thought that it would take many more years before she ever crafted something equivalent to a masterpiece. No, truthfully, she wasn't confident that she could ever accomplish such a thing. For her to achieve that now, out of nowhere, was unbelievable. Like, she doesn't even have confidence in herself, which is sad. There's no way I can make something that would be put in that back storage. It wasn't like she made this with a few simple hours of work. She devoted a considerable amount of time to it. She should have finished it more quickly. She should have used a full extent of her magic while making it. But it had taken a whole month. She used every bit of knowledge and experience she accumulated in creating this one. But still, never in a million years would she expect to turn out so well. She didn't think of herself capable of such a thing. If someone were to tell her to do it again, she'd doubt that she could manage it. But there was no mistaking it. The figurine in her hands was something of her own creation. Emotion washed over her. And soon enough, a face popped into her mind. An oval-shaped one with glasses. Belonging to an altogether plain-looking mature boy, Zenoba. <laughs> it is interesting right here. I have to note, she said that it took a whole month. So... It, what, it seemed as if it was implying that she was hiding it What she realized what she had made because she wanted to present it in a great way. But why would, after a whole month of her working on this thing, does Zenoba never see it? Now, it could be that Zenoba was never paying attention to it because it wasn't finished. But still, I have to show it to Master, she thought. No doubt, Zenoba would screech the top of his lungs and circle around the room, gushing when he saw it. She also knew that he would shower her with praise, too. I have to let him see it immediately. With that thought in mind, she picked up the figurine, intending to head straight to Zenoba. The problem was that he was on the outskirts of Shariya, working on adjusting Rius's magic armor at the moment. If she made a dash for it, she would be able to reach him before he headed home. That would guarantee that they wouldn't miss each other. Julie paused at the door, lips pinched in thought, as she held the figurine in her hand. It was a top-quality piece. That much she was sure of. Every cell in her body screamed, that it was a masterpiece. But could she really show it to Zenoba like this? He'd be delighted, sure. But upon consideration, all of the other masterpieces he had shown her were carefully tucked in wooden boxes, lined with beautiful fabric. Every few days, Zenoba would open the boxes of his most prized figurines to check in on them. He always wore a look of deep anticipation 
as he pulled through the lace, holding the box shut. His face would light up when he saw the figurines inside. His touch ever so delicate as he lifted it up and placed it on his desk, admiring it with a breathy sigh. Yes, a box, a necessary component in amplifying a masterpiece's quality. Julie glanced around her working area. She looked at all the work tools and supplies that she used for figure making, but nothing there resembled a box. Since her magic supplied all of her necessary materials for her craft, as per the style Ruiz had taught her, she didn't have the supplies she could use to make a box with. Just use earth magic to make all the sides, there you go. She did, however, have a white linen bag. It jingled when she picked it up. It wasn't too heavy, but it was a respectable weight. Tucked inside were some copper and silver Austrian coins. Zenova paid Julie a wage for all of her work. She couldn't quite remember when he had started that, but he insisted she take it in case she ever needed something suddenly. Lately, he had been paying her a particularly generous amount. Ginger was none too pleased, insisting, I don't see why it's necessary for her to have money. But Zenoba ignored her protest. His insistence on paying her made her suspect Grandmaster Rudius had said something to him. Julie pondered this deeply. This was precisely the sort of situation where she needed something suddenly. She grabbed the money and headed to the artisan quarter. The place where she was heading was none other than Belfry's shop. Zenoba had dragged her there numerous times before, so she knew just how much he respected the quality of Belford's work. It was why she decided to purchase a bed that would suit her figurine, so she could present it to Zenoba. Alas, things did not end the way that she anticipated. The price was far steeper than she could pay. The products featured in the store were beyond her means with her current income. That was only natural because these pieces were made for nobility. Shocked as she was about the price tag, she refused to give up and try to barter with Belfried. Zenoba was one of Belfried's valued clients. He didn't purchase any dolls, but he did have enormous praise for the beds that Belfried made. He would bring his own figurines and have Belfried construct specially made beds for them. The better the quality of the work that he brought in, the cheaper Belfried would be willing to go on his prices. <laughs> he was like, he's like, I need to make a bed for that. I need to make a bed for that. I'll come down in price. That was why she hoped she could get a deal she could afford by showing him the figurine that she had. Things didn't go the way that she had hoped this time either. Well, no, that wasn't entirely correct. Her plan was actually on point. The moment Belfried laid eyes on the figurine, his excitement skyrocketed. He screeched like an inhumane creature and scrambled back into his depths of his shop, coming back with an enormous sack of gold coins. He immediately used it to plead for her to sell it to him. I would be more than happy to make a bed for her, he said. I'll make one so grand that she can sleep in warmth and comfort at my side for the rest of her life. You'll find no one more suited to keeping her than me, <laughs> especially with my skills at bed making. I'll put that beautiful girl to rest <laughs> and let her sleep peacefully in a one-of-a-kind cushion. Now, please, be a dear, accept my offer. Like, it, his comments right here makes him seem way more creepier than he was before. Like, yeah, like the whole thing with the dolls and the beds and everything, that's just kind of a... Like a, I don't know, it's like a cat lady type of thing, but this is like, we're going, okay, whoa. His eyes were unnaturally wide and drool <laughs> dribbled from his mouth as he pressed on. Naturally, that scared her. Her entire body trembled. Julie instinctively shoved him away and made a break for the door. Belfry gave chase, but fear propelled her legs as hard as they could go. She slammed into a shelf on her way out the door and sent the contents scattering on the floor. But she didn't look as she needed to make her escape. Unfortunately for her, Belfry also ignored that and continued to charge after her, screaming something incomprehensible as he did. Somehow, Julie managed to shake him off her trail and made it back to the dorm room, huffing and puffing. Her body continued to tremble in fear for a while after that. She feared that he might kick down the door at any moment and come stomping in after her. Luckily, that didn't happen, and Zenova returned later, which helped her regain her composure. That poor girl. <laughs> this poor girl this is so terrified. Julie couldn't go back to the shop now, not after what transpired, so what else could she do? That night, she puzzled over the matter until she last remembered something that Rudius had told her. If you need something and you don't already have it, just make it. She couldn't remember why or when he said that, but regardless, they had purchased her for that very purpose, to craft things. And now, she had earth magic, and the tools necessary to shape whatever she conjured and polish it to perfection. The very next day, Julie began to use her supplies to make a box. She conjured the basic shape with her earth magic, then used her mana and tools to trim them down. She'd done this hundreds of thousands of times before. It didn't matter if it was a box or a figurine in the initial phase, at least. Completing the project was difficult, though, since the more intricate details required different processes and skill set. She was still not done after several days of work. Maybe about 70%, though. It was impressive progress, considering she had never done anything like that before. As she crafted her box, a memory of her young years came back to her. She saw her parents' faces, dimly lit, dreary, cramped in a little house. She honestly didn't have many fond memories of them. They were often yelling at each other over money or otherwise looking forlorn. The only good thing that she could say about them was that they did work hard. 
night after night with only a single candle for light. They slowly whittled away at something. Her father was normally boisterous during the daytime, but when night came, he was deathly silent as he wove metal together into a chain-like end product. What stood out most to Julie's memories was her mother's ornaments. She would whittle a block of wood into the most beautiful lily. Julie couldn't remember what her mother eventually put those lilies on, but she vividly remembered the flowers themselves. With those memories as a guide, she carved lilies into her own box. Seeing it gradually approach completion made each day more enjoyable than last. Surely, Zenobia would be pleased, wouldn't he? She wondered how he would express his delight. Would he gleefully screech like he normally did? Or would he squint so hard that his eyes would vanish into his cheeks, showing more muted joy? The more she imagined it, the more her heart hammered in anticipation. It is actually interesting that reading this a second time, how she goes back to thinking about her parents. And again, I think this is kind of getting that whole question mark that I've been having with this set of chapters is, again, did she hate her parents? Again, it, it definitely kind of hints at the idea that she didn't enjoy her times and she has all these, these bad memories about her parents and everything. But at least it kind of shows that idea that there's still inspiration there. No experience, no matter how negative it is, is still experience. And those experiences are what basically mold us. They shape us. So even at your worst memory, even those memories that you wish you can forget, in some cases, it's going to teach you something. And with this, I think what it's sort of pulling here, what Julie is pulling here from her parents was how hard they worked. Yes, they were always hardworking. They were putting everything into it. They looked miserable. They looked, it, looked, it was a sad situation, but they worked hard. In, in every mention of her parents in these chapters, the one thing they keep putting out is, no matter what, they were good at what they did. They were really good craftsmen. And yes, they were making, they were just making too grand of things that they couldn't sell fast enough. And they were taking in too much debt. But in the end of the day, they were extremely skilled. And they were hard workers. And right here, it's kind of molding into Julie's mind. Yes, she's like, crap, I need a box. This whole thing screwed up. I need a box. Okay, Rudius told me, if you can't, if you can't find it, make it. Which I think is a great way, mindset, by the way. That's technically what created Otaku Spirit podcast. The original podcast of Otaku Spirit was created on the mindset, if you can't find a podcast that you find enjoyable, that does the things that you want it to do, make it. And I made it. I made it with my brother. And this is the same mindset here. You, that's what Rudius has. Coming to this world, and that's technically what Rudius is bringing over from our, our world, is he's going, okay, this is this other world that obviously doesn't have technology like I have, and I need this thing, so I'll make it. And yes, there is there is a side of it that was like, wow, Silent Seven Star was doing a lot more than I was. <laughs> Why couldn't she have brought AC over here? Whatever. Um, it's kind of the same process there. It's like, if you can't find it, make it. And so she takes that. And what does she immediately think of? Okay, I, I can't buy it, obviously. The thing that I wanted, that whole thing screwed up. So I'll make the box. And then her mind immediately, despite the fact that she likes drinking and it gets away to all those negative memories, she still thinks about her parents. How hard they worked. Wheeling away. She's doing that same thing. Wheeling away. Just feeling that thing that's going to be perfect for my master. It's tragic and, and kind of inspiring at the same time. As has already been written many times, Julie was truly grateful of Zenoba and Rudius. She was also satisfied of her current life. She wanted things to continue like this. That was her wish. Julie, do you really wish to stop being my slave? Those words cut deep in her heart. <laughs> Uh, it's always like the, it's always like, I think I'm going to ball my eyes out if I read this part like I did the first time. And there's other parts where I'm like, yeah, I was pretty okay when I read that the first time and it hits. It hurts. She had a bad feeling the moment she saw him walk in with Belfried in tow. After all, the two were quite good friends and she had shoved Belfried and fled his shop. When she knocked over one of his shelves in the process, she might have also damaged some of his merchandise. Only now did she realize how incredibly rude she had been. She expected Zenoba to be angry with her. He never yelled at her, but he had been cross with her on some occasions. He was especially strict when it came to her doing something wrong. Sometimes he would punish her to make sure that she understood what she did was wrong and to not make that same mistake the next time. When Zenoba got angry with her, Julie would frantically try to right the wrong. Usually that was enough to fix things. In fact, Zenoba and Rudius were always quick to forgive her. Why then? Did she panic? The answer was quite simple. Oh, so utterly simple. Julie pursed her lips, thought it through. She was convinced she'd upset Zenoba over the treatment of Belfried. If she had damaged his beautiful merchandise, of course Zenoba would be angry about it. Those were expensive goods. 
produced for nobility, which would mean a great personal loss to Belfried if they were broken. The cost would probably far overshadow any price she could fetch if they were to sell her. <sighs> she's, it, it, it's sad how bad she's r reading this and it's obvious conclusion that she would come to, but that hurts. That product, I knocked over a couple of dolls off of a shelf, just knocked them over, but they're more valuable in society, their value and worth for coin is worth more than me. That's how worthless and low value me as a slave is. Ouch. Ouch. Still, that's her mindset. If somebody, if somehow whoop, things just kind of reset, Julie's sitting there, product sitting there, they ask Rudius, who would you buy? Heartbeat. In a heartbeat, buying Julie back. But she doesn't She doesn't get that. She's seeing actual value, what society would deem value. This was much worse than she had anticipated. Even Rius was involved now, and they were considering letting her go. That was her guess. Maybe it would have been different if it was just Zenoba. Maybe it wouldn't end up like this if not for her running with Belfried. Maybe she wouldn't have felt so much pressure if Rudius hadn't been present too. Perhaps she would calmly consider what he was saying and answer truthfully that she still wanted to be at his side. Alas, that was not the case. Julie's vision went white, her mind spinning in circles, and she tried to wreck her brain for response. What should she do in the situation? She had to do something, didn't she? Her thoughts wandered to the way that Belfry acted at the shop and the price that he had offered her for the figure. In a desperate attempt to cling to her final hope of salvation, Julie ran to her room. It felt like the world was closing in around her. Her legs were unsteady as they carried her, and her hands kept trembling. But she somehow managed to reach under her bed and pull out the thing that she had hidden there. The figurine. The very masterpiece that she made herself. The one thing that Belfried wanted desperately. Julie gripped her creation in her hands and hurried back to Zenoba and the others. She walked right past him and sank to her knees in front of Belfried. I'll give this to you, so please, please forgive me. Tears and snot poured down her face. The first thing that she had to do was subdue his anger, which was why she brought out the figurine and offered it. Rudius and Zenoba were both flabbergasted by her actions. Rudius never dreamt that she would have such a reaction. He assumed that they would gently broach the subject with Julie, since it would be difficult for her to admit that she no longer wanted to be their slave. That's why Rudius was caught off guard by Zenoba blurting out the question. The only person not floored was Belfried. He planned to negotiate a price, but now it was being offered to him, which he joyfully reached for. <laughs> That freaking image hurts. <laughs> that image hurts so bad. <laughs> Poor Julie. Again, I don't mind misunderstandings, but I hate it when it's painful. Oh, you allow me to have it? Oh, well, if you insist. Wait, what is the meaning of this? Reese grabbed his hand to stop him. Surprise had left his face. And instead, he looked both angry and on guard. Why is Julie sobbing and begging for forgiveness? Well, I I'm afraid of having the foggiest. Well, neither do I. But would you really be satisfied getting your hands on that figurine you want for free? Don't kid yourself. You know that's way too good to be true. True, when you put it like that. I would, mm -hmm. Um, Master Rudius, the strength of your grip is rather painful. Rudius' strength was amplified by his gauntlet, and a cold sweat beaded down Belfried's forehead. No matter how chummy you are with Zenoba, that's no excuse to rob an innocent girl of her figure. You got that? I truly meant what I said. I haven't the faintest idea why she's doing this. Um, Master Zenoba, won't you help me out? Both looking to Zenoba, he was frozen in place. Eyes glued to the figurine in Julie's hands. Rudius thought Zenoba had died standing up. <laughs> Suddenly, Zenoba shifted very, very slowly as Rudius and Belfried watched speechless. His expression was utterly ghastly, terrifying. Even Julie noticed the change of his demeanor. She turned to him and mumbled, I'm so sorry. In that instant, Zenoba jerked forward, slammed on his knees before her. He reached out for the figure, stopping a hair's breadth from touching it. Master, it's incredible. It was like a dam broke open. It's absolutely stunning. This is, it's... Words fail to express its magnificence. From the very top of its head to the tip of its toes, it's breathtakingly beautiful. I would be at a loss to pinpoint its precise strengths. But its posture, the fingertips, and the small wrinkles in its clothing, it raises the quality to a whole nother level. And it fits together perfectly. Oh. Zidane was so happy. <laughs> it's like all this chaos is happening. And he's just like, figure. As he gushed, he never touched the figurine as it was like a divine object that he feared touching. <laughs> so why? Why then, Julie? Why? Huh? She gasped back at him. Why did you try to give it to Belfried without even showing it to me first? Have I done something to offend you? I don't understand. You have always shown me every project you have completed before. Zenobi began sobbing ugly tears. <laughs> was, was he sad that he couldn't have the figurine? 
Or was it due to Julie's betrayal? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Both. I think Rudius mentions the idea that he thinks it's like 60% the first and then 40% the betrayal. But I don't know. Yeah, I, I think there is a side of it that he's like upset that she would not show this to him because this is something that she always does. And then suddenly she's not doing that. I don't know that there's like a betrayal aspect even in his mind. But yeah, he didn't even mention the idea of that he wasn't being given the figuring. I suppose you really did want to raise money to buy your own freedom. If that's the case, why did you not speak to me first? I would happily pay 300 gold coins for this figurine. No, perhaps I could pull together more funds immediately. But I swear, I will find a way if necessary. I stake my honor on it. And you should be familiar enough with me by now to know I am willing to pay for it. Um... Uh, uh, master, um, or is it that you fear that I might try to use my influence over you to steal it? I must admit, in retrospect, that you may have crafted a number of figurines for me without proper compensation. I reasoned that it was fine, since you are a slave and you are still inexperienced at the time. And even though you have improved immensely recently, I still haven't given you pay you deserve. Zenoba held his head as he gazed at the ceiling. I am so sorry. So terribly sorry, Julie. Allow me to apologize. I'll bow in apology however many times it takes. I may not be able to offer you the same price Belfried has, but in exchange, as your master, I will grant whatever wish you have. Thus, I must beg you, please allow me to have it. <laughs> Gosh dang, Zenova. This guy lost it. Zenova's lost it. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> well, Zenova behaved as Belfry did earlier. She didn't feel fearful. She trusts him. That was because she knew he was showing consideration for the figure, but not her. He was clearly not angry with her. When she understood that, some other emotion welled up inside of her. Tears filled her eyes and soon left warm trails down her cheeks. But this time, she wasn't crying out of fear or desperation. Yes, I understand, Master. She never had intention of rebuffing his request. Through sniffling through her tears, she managed to smile at him. Oh, thank you, Julie. He grinned back. It was awkward, but the atmosphere was tempered by warmth. Can someone explain to me how things even came to this? <laughs> Zenoba and... It says Zenoba and Julie exchanged blank glances, but I think that's supposed to be Belfried and Rudius exchanged glances, blank glances. It doesn't make any sense that Zenoba and Julie, who are literally crying their eyes out right now, and Zenoba right now is, like, focused on this thing. Like, the world does not exist as Zenoba right now. So it makes sense more sense that Rudius and Belfried are blankly staring at each other, like... What the hell just happened? It's, whatever, seven, seven seas. The misunderstanding was resolved quickly. By the end of the conversation, Zenoba and Rudius were relieved, and Julie relaxed. Belfried apologized profusely, and in spite of his gazes at the figurine, he took his leave. <laughs> he, he lost. Fortunately, Rudius was tolerant when people made mistakes due to misunderstandings, so he quickly forgave Belfried, apologized for gripping his arm so tightly, and offered Julie and Zenoba a troubled smile before leaving home. <laughs> yeah, he's like... Rudeus is, and I don't know why Rudeus is so confused by the situation, but I guess it's kind of like, again, from Rudeus' perspective, they went to Belfried, they thought that Julie was sneaking behind them to, to free herself, they come in there, literally, Zenoba's like, do you want to leave me? Julie runs off, grabs a figurine, runs back in, says, please take this, I'm so sorry, and then... The guy's like, yeah, I'll take it. Rudius stops the guy like, dude, we need to we, we need to know what the hell's going on here. The, the, you shouldn't be doing that. And then Zenoba freaks out and says, please give it to me. That's all Rudius knows in this situation. So he's a little bit confused. We at least get a perspective of everything that Julie has thought of this point. So it does make sense that he's like, okay, you guys are good. <laughs> I'm going home. <laughs> Rudius is like, whatever. Uh, I, it, it makes sense to what Zenoba did, but he's a little confused as to what led up to this. Ginger arrived as Rudius was leaving and scolded Zenoba after getting filled in. You treat her so well and have given her such a good education? One would be hard pressed to believe that she was actually a slave. There's simply no reason she would try to buy her freedom without saying a word to you first. It's discourteous of you to doubt your subjects like that. Your Highness. <laughs> Ginger gotta get him. Get him, Ginger. Get him, Ginger. <laughs> Ginger's literally all of us. What the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> Zenoba didn't really listen to her lecture. Too busy studying the figurine before him. He had it on a pedestal in the middle of the room. He would pace around it, scrutinizing every angle and smiling proudly 
grinning, or sighing. As for Julie, she kept watching Zenoba, smiling with relief, cheeks colored slightly red. Julie, this is an incredible figurine. You have done well. I never dreamt that you have this level of skill. It's really only a coincidence that I managed it. I doubt I could reproduce it to this level of quality again. What are you saying? This masterful craftsmanship is a product of your hard work. You made every inch of it carefully, beautifully even. Perhaps some of the parts only turned out perfect by coincidence, but at least half of this is a product of your own abilities. Thank you. I'm going to continue honing my skills. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> Very good. And also, Julie, I meant what I said earlier. If there's anything you desire, you need only speak. I'll do whatever in my power to grant your wish. Um, let me think about it a little bit longer. She spoke awkwardly, feeling embarrassed by his praise. Your Highness, I understand how much you love your figurines, but it's nearly time to eat. Julie, help me with preparations. Oh, of course. Julie thought this moment would last for an eternity, but Ginger brought her back to reality. Perhaps the other woman was a little cross about being left out. <laughs> Doubt it. <laughs> Could be. Julie did as she was told, helping with preparations. Zenobo watched the two, eyes narrowed. He looked away from the figurine. What? <laughs> he looked away from the figurine? <laughs> His life right now was rather simple, far removed from life in the palace. Yet he could spend all day fiddling with figurines, and no one would get mad at him. Plus, he had someone at his side who could make them for him, which provided him with a constant source of new figurines. Nothing could be more ideal. Flag, 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 flag. <laughs> it would be wonderful if he can keep living like this forever, flag. Hmm? Suddenly, he noticed a sealed letter sitting nearby the door. Julie must have received it on his behalf while he was out. He casually strolled over and examined it. Oh. His happy expression disappeared. Opening the letter, he glanced at its contents. I suppose there's no way it could ever last. The envelope slipped through his fingers, fluttering through the air, hitting the floor. The seal of Sharon Kingdom was stamped on it. And that is chapter 11. My gosh, <laughs> that was <laughs> it took much longer to get through than I thought it would. Uh, of course, I barely condensed anything. It's just like all this stuff was just so good. Ugh, when I read it the first time. Sadly, I didn't have much to really discuss like I was originally thinking I would. But at the same time, this stuff is super good. Finally... Again, sad that it wasn't first-person perspective, really, but it was mostly, it, it sort of was, it's again, third-person kind of things, and it was really getting into her head and stuff and what she was thinking, which does technically give you that first-person perspective, but it, it's just so, it's so good to finally get, I always love, like, perspectives outside of Rudeus. I love finally seeing what Julie thinks about her situation. What has she always been thinking about her situation? All the way from the beginning, the moment that she was with her parents and how much she just was suffering even at that point, never having much to eat and living with them and them constantly fighting and constantly working hard to build the next thing. Again, they were really skilled. It's just they they sucked at their at marketing and, and selling and all that kind of stuff. They're 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 basically the manufacturer, they're not the actual retail, they're not the seller. These are two different things. You can make something really good, but selling it to somebody is a completely different story. I like me right now, just do, doing YouTube. Like I'm in that like that middle area where I'm not. I don't feel that I'm good at like a really good person at making content. Like I'm getting better, and I'm always trying to get better. I mean, I hate looking at my first videos. <laughs> I really do. I they look so bad. I'm I'm working to get better. And yes, even on the other side, I don't feel like I'm the best person at marketing my content and getting it out there, but I'm learning new methods and getting new ways of doing that. Yes, how much can I make my stuff more, so to speak, clickbaity, but not necessarily what people would consider clickbait? Something that grabbed grab attention, but not lie at people is the main key thing there. How can I make my thumbnails more eye-catchy? All these things. So I'm like, I'm trying to build out there. And so that's what we're having right here with her parents. They were literally the craftsmen. They just, like, there's no, like, the, no skill in this, the marketing part of it, the selling part of it. They are craftsmen. That's, first and foremost, they're craftsmen. So you can't expect them to do both sides of the thing perfectly. And she watched that. But again, my question mark the entire time was, does she hate her parents? And, I, and it sucks that that's the first thing that comes to my mind, but that's a very important question. Do you hate your parents? And maybe it's something that'll come up later. Again, if there's a possibility that she actually runs into them, which could happen, I would be totally open to that. 
I don't think that she'd be like, oh, there's mom. Bye, Zenoba. I want to be with mom again. But I think it's going to be one of those things of, like, she did get something from her parents. So it, it at least shows that there's a connection there. Not that she, I, I believe that she loved them, but she at least has memories of her mom taking care of her. And even though she was sad in the whole, the, the whole thing itself, but the reluctancy comment was a little bit of a, a painful thing to hear, though. <laughs> the reluctancy. But again, that's that whole thing of they got things to do. So, of course, they're going to have that reluctancy. Not that she's not going to do it because she still did it. But they're still going to be that reluctancy because they're, they're, they're obviously trying to get things done. But again, it at least shows that she got something from them. And that was that hard effort. Again, as she's toiling away at that box, she's thinking about her parents all night, working away at something, trying to make it as perfect possible. Oh, that's right. Mom made that, that flower. I can do that too. The fact that she took that and applied it there shows that she got something out of it. But yeah, obviously painful, the whole experience of her going into the slave markets and everything like that being kind of abandoned, which we kind of got a sense of there. But again, I think the big standout in that whole situation was her in how she was really thinking when Rudius asked her, do you want to die? And why she said no. And again, how she, it seems that as if she got out of him an unspoken message of you still got a little bit left in you. You want to try again? And again, it was technically in his, in Reese's mind, the idea of, yeah, I can take her and we can go try this. I can clean her up and get her all good and everything. But if she doesn't want it, it doesn't matter. I think that's what she picked up on. Oh, he's saying that if I have a little bit and I could try again, let's try it. And she just, uh, seemingly, it just came out. I want to live. I want to do this. Let's do it. It's, it's super, super interesting. And again, getting a little bit more into what she thinks of Rudius her getting comfort with them, what she thinks of Zenoba, and what she found joy in. Again, something that's been left unanswered this whole time. And I think even if, from Ruiz's perspective, if he asked her, would he get a true answer? We got the true answer. She found joy in what she does now. And she doesn't want to lose that. I think it's telling when she says, this is a guy that I'm afraid of because he was offering to snuff out my life and he could technically do it now and he would take away what I've gotten here. Showing a sign that she's comfortable and she's gained new purpose and she doesn't want to lose it. Before she was willing to die, now she doesn't want to. That's a huge thing. That she's now found purpose and she's got this new life that she loves. Such a good chapter. <laughs> it's such a good chapter. And it's kind of relieving after, shoot, um, not the best volume overall. And yes, we still have one more chapter and obviously we're not going to get to it now because holy crap, this has gone way longer than I thought it would. Um, I'll probably just do the last chapter and go right into the volume 19 is what we'll probably end up doing. But it's good to have this chapter. And, and I love the previous two chapters because they were a lot of fun. And we had the whole thing with Lada and Laplace and, and uh, Lucy. But yeah, like like these three chapters right here at the end. And I'm sure that the next chapter is going to be really good because it's obvious where it's going. Sharon uh, it was going to be a question mark. My predictions around that, I'm going to assume that throwing out their packs. I, I, I just think that Pax probably got back in there. I mean, they implied that Pax was being sent as a prisoner. But I, I think that was kind of just sort of a formality there. Pax is really clever. And I, I would assume that he could probably still use his connections in the slave trade to get back in there and take over. And even more so, because they kicked him out, they were reluctant to do that because he had connections to the slaves. So if they kicked Pax out... The slaves probably didn't like that because they were working with Pax. And so Pax could pro possibly come back there, use his even use his connection with the slave trade to get back there and take over. I don't know. Because, again, they, they sort of imply the idea that Pax had a lot of strength, a lot of power. Yes, part of it was because of the connection with the slaves, but he also had a lot of soldiers. But they imply that he got those taken away from him. But he's a conniving dude. I can see him totally doing it again. Go back in there, kidnap, kidnap people again, kidnap family members, and take over all the the soldiers and 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 take over. I don't know. Other than that, I, I mean, I can assume I can see possibly the father passing away, and then it went to the next prince, which I forget which one it was. It was a second prince or maybe the third prince. One of the princes like had most of the power. 
I can see one of them possibly, maybe there was a battle about the throne itself, and then they want to bring him in the picture somehow as possibly somebody they can find as an ally. Maybe one of the brothers is like, okay, now that dad's out of the way, why not bring Zenoba back? Because he, father was dumb for sending him away. Yes, they're terrified of Zenoba. <laughs> the brothers were terrified of him. But they can still see him being a valuable asset in the idea that he is strong. Question mark is, what is the... Obviously, Zenoba in his response to the, to the letter is, this couldn't last forever. Which implies Zenoba is going to get involved with whatever the letter says. Now, the letter could say, we're coming to get you, Zenoba, um, for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why. But most likely, because he's responding that way, it means that something's happening in Sharon, and he feels an obligation or desire to get involved, which is a big question mark in my mind. Because all indications has been given this idea that Zenoba doesn't really care about his family. He just wanted his dolls. He, they basically sent him off in his room and he was messing with his dolls. And so after he got sent away, his big concern was I'm getting separated from my master, the guy that's, the guy that's going to show me figurines. And then he devoted himself to making, uh, to learning earth magic in order to make figurines. And now he's been happy up here. But there was one very brief indication at some point that Zenoba still had care for his homeland. And that surprised Rudius. This, this was like, whoa, um... I don't remember. It was like volume 14 or something like that. At some point, there was a comment that was made. Uh, it was when they went back to um, the Demon Continent. That's what it was. They went back to the Demon Continent, and Zenoba said something about his homeland. And Maurice was shocked by it. He's like, well, I guess even this guy has some sort of... He's, he gets homesick too or something like that. So it implied at that moment in that scenario that Zenoba still has some sort of care for his homeland. But the question mark is there, it, around that's going to be is, What? Is it that just there, even though he doesn't have any care for being a leader, which he's stated before, I don't care. I don't care about this land. I don't care about being the king. He had no care about his position. So the question is, is what care does he have for the kingdom? Yes, he's even mentioned before that he has no care for having power, becoming the king or anything like that. Just as long as he got his figurine, he's good. But why would he care to go back home? Will it be one of those aspects is that we have this wrong impression of Zenoba? That he actually does love his family, that he does love his father, that he does uh, love his kingdom, that he does love that land. It's just that he's always been focused on the dolls, that it's not his priority because somebody else is handling it. Maybe we're just getting the assumption that he doesn't care about it because he's always talking about dolls and figurines. I'm going to be very curious because I love Zenoba. For those who don't know, uh, if you're new here, welcome. <laughs> I love Zenoba. I think he's a fascinating character because he he thinks different. He's kind of special in a way. I always kind of describe him as being sort of special in a way that he just doesn't think the same way other people do. He's kind of like somebody that would have some sort of brain trauma or something like that. That things just don't really kind of shoot across his brain like most people would have it shoot across their brain. He makes decisions that seem off to most people. So to actually get into what actually makes him tick when it comes to his homeland is going to be really fascinating and I cannot wait to get into it. So I am kind of bummed that I'm not getting into it now. But yeah, I'm going to cut it off there. I hope you guys enjoyed this Mashuka Monday. I don't want to go any further than this because it's going to hurt to edit, but I greatly appreciate you guys dropping by for the premiere Hagen chat. Hope you guys had a great Mashuka Monday and I hope you have a great rest of your Monday. As per usual, I greatly appreciate everybody that supports the channel through hitting the like button. If you didn't hit the like button, shame on you. Uh, Patreon tips, links, super thanks, all that stuff. It means so much to me. Uh, it's just your guys' kind words as well. It means so much to me. I had some great comments being given to me on Discord the other day, and it's like, gosh, you guys are feeling me. <laughs> you guys feel me with your positive comments and all that stuff. It just it means a great deal to me that you guys are enjoying me for this journey through this that is just as fulfilling for me as it is for you. But with all that said, until the next Mashuka Monday, hope you guys enjoyed, and y'all take care. Happy Mashuko Mondays, everybody. Welcome back to yet another Trek the Mashuko Tensei Jabba's Reincarnation novel series. We're on volume 18, chapter 10, question mark. Through sniffling, through her eyes. And you should. And you should be familiar enough with me to know I know. <laughs> this takes so much air to say his lines. I gotta force a grunt. I would be, I would happily pay 300 gold coins for this figurine. Wow. Oh,
14? 14. Or death by hyperthermia. Or death by hyperthermia. 